All right, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Well, I'm in Jaker. Welcome to the Northland Youth Space uh, from the city of Darabin. Uh, we are going out live uh, to an estimated 3 million, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, uh, to a Facebook audience courtesy of the Darabin Youth Services page. Uh, and just to prove to the live stream that we actually have real human beings in the room, if you could just raise your arms and wave them around so the camera can pick them up, thank you very much. So those of you at home uh, and everyone here, welcome to the third of our um, uh, jobs forums, this one relating to employment for young people. And before we get into the detail, I would like to welcome to the microphone um, Wurundjeri Corporation's Emma Mildenhall, who will be leading us in a welcome to country. Emma. Hi. Thank you to Philip for introducing me here today. Hi, my name is Emma Mildenhall from the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation. I would like to say welcome to everyone in Woiwurrung language, Wurundjika Wurundjeri Balak Yiman Kundibik, meaning welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri people. I am a proud Aboriginal woman. My tribe is Wurundjeri Woiwurrung, being Melbourne CBD and surrounding country. We are a part of the Kulin Nation, which consists of the five following tribes, Wurundjeri, Wathurong, Tanarong, Boonwurrung and Jajarurrung. I would like to pay my respect to my ancestors, also to elders past, present and emerging. I would like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here attending today and I would also like to pay my respect to your elders. I would also like to acknowledge all people here today from all backgrounds. I would also like to acknowledge Councillor Lena Messina, Mayor of Darabin here today. My Aboriginal ancestry is William Barrack and his sister Annie Borat. My grandmother, Martha Margaret Nicholson, Nana's maiden name prior to marriage being Terrick, was delivered by her grandmother, Jemima, on Corrindirk Aboriginal Mission near Hillsville. My great-great-grandmother taught my grandmother the importance of family, culture and caring for one another. My grandmother married my Irish grandfather called Patrick and they had 16 children. Yes. <laughs> my auntie Patricia Ockwell is the eldest sibling and my mother Georgina Nicholson is the youngest, also an elder and newly appointed board member for the Rundry Corporation. I'm so grateful to be here today and be a part of this event. Aboriginal people have lived off this land, including hunting and gathering and cared for country for a very long time, being one of the oldest living cultures, Australia's traditional owners. We have a strong connection to the land and waters and a strong passion to care for it, including the fauna and flora. Prior to settlement, we had practices to care for country that are still relevant today. And my people are active today, such as being a part of fire prone areas and waterways protection, along with restoring waterways, not only as an obligation and a right, but also as a privilege. I hope that everyone has a really lovely day here today and thank you all very much for having me a part of it. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you, Emma, for those wonderful words. Um, unfortunately, um, the mayor is running a little late. Oh, actually, right on time. Um, making a grand entrance. <laughs> Would you please welcome to the stage the mayor of the city of Darabin, Councillor Lena Messina. <laughs> Um, it's great to be here. I remember this, oh yeah, I'm a bit short, so it needs to come down a little bit. Um, I do recall when this site was the ROCV, um, this is how long um, I know this area for. I don't know how, how many of you have known this area to be the old ROCV building. It's quite a long time ago, isn't it? 
Um, first of all, can I please say thank you. I'm really excited about being here this morning and I thank you for the kind invitation and I'd like to acknowledge that we stand on the grounds of Wondery Warring people and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to recognise any First Nations peoples that are here with us this morning. Um, this Welcome everybody. This is the third... Um, the third series of the Jobs Forum designed to assist in getting our Darabin community back to work. Each of these forums outlines the challenges and the opportunities that exist in the employment and disadvantaged and mar mar marginalised groups. Previously, we've presented forums that have highlighted employment challenges for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, those from newly arrived multicultural backgrounds and people with lived and experiences of disability. Recordings of these are available on Council's YouTube channel. Today, our forum focuses on employment for the young people, that we know um, it has been some challenges during the COVID lockdown period. Unemployment in Darabin increased by more than 50%. Darabin found itself reporting the second highest unemployment levels of any LGA in the inner metropolitan Melbourne region. Some groups were hit harder than most, with job seeker caseload numbers doubling for the cold community and for our young people under the age of 25. More than 104,000 young people across the state lost their jobs, resulting in a youth unemployment rate in Victoria of 16.2%. This is, of course, now stabilising, and the worst of the lockdowns are hopefully beyond, behind us, and Darwin Face Job Active Providers recorded a total of 467 young people aged under 25 on their combined caseload. In February 2022, compared with 637 in late 2020, 2020. But figures and numbers don't tell the whole story. We know that young people were impacted disproportionately during the lockdown months. A report on Youth Affairs Council of Victoria prepared that at the height of the pandemic stated that emerging public health data demonstrates a devastating impact of the pandemic on mental health of young people in Victoria. There has been 33% rise in young people presenting to hospitals with self-harm injuries. Those numbers are alarming and I look forward to the state government um, budget proposal and hoping that there is something that addresses this and it needs to be done. So I look forward to that, hopefully that announcement in May. Support agencies were overwhelmed with calls of assistance and many young people were unable to find help just when they needed it most. The isolation of lockdowns combined with the loss of jobs in the sectors typically employing young people such as retail and hospitality combined to raise anxiety levels to heights never experienced before. It's going to take time with the whole of the community effort to turn this situation around and increase sustainable employment opportunities for young people. As part of this effort, federal and state sponsored agencies such as the Local Jobs Coordinator Program and Jobs Record at Jobs Victoria, incorporating the Jobs Victoria Employment Service programs bring together funding and resources to support job seekers and employment employers. Darwin City Council is also meeting the challenge head on. Through the council plan, I and my colleague, council colleagues, and I'd like to acknowledge, I've just seen her, um, Councillor Julie Williams at the back of the room, so can we please just give her a warm welcome. Sorry, I just noticed you, Julie. Um, continue to stimulating, stimulating local solutions and catalysts in jobs creation at a scale including for the young people and others who face multiple employment barriers. These leads us to, performing, to forming partnerships and agreements so we could deliver services, including job advocates who support and mentor job seekers to build the cap cap capability to enter and re-enter the workforce. A Jarvan's based Jobs Victoria Employment Service Program created through the partnership with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence also allows us to tap into resources that support employers as well as job seekers. 
Durban City Council plan also will be facilitating a, a Durban Chamber of Commerce. I look for also for that opportunity, that partnership, where we can work together with the youth, whether we've got industry leaders working together through council and with the youth moving forward. Durban also been uh, working to identify and connecting with bringing together a broad range of services and supports that are six, exist around us. We also have a dedicated team working directly with young people, including youth outreach and drop-in spaces such as the hub where we're meeting today. Over the years, the youth team has helped organise jobs fairs, fairs in partnership with Northland Shopping Centre and we've led to real opportunities for young people in Darabin. So much of the support infrastructure is, to place, is placed in Darabin design to make numbers tell a more positive story. But this can only be done when we're working effectively together and that's where you come in. Today we'll be hearing from an amazing group of speakers, most of whom young people themselves, who will speak about their experiences of navigating the employment scene, of transitioning from school into work, of the pitfalls and the benefits of getting into employment and how they got their jobs and how they hold them. Then we'll, we'll, we will hear firsthand from employees themselves about how they engage with young people, what opportunities their workplaces offer and what benefits young people can bring to the workplace. Finally, we'll be encouraging all of you to get involved in the conversation to ask questions, connect and share. In the spirit, we can all play and, st and pay a part in getting back, Durban back to work. Now, um, thank you very much. I look forward to speaking to you all. And I'm sorry I'm a little bit late, but now I'd like to introduce Philip back to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Messina. Um, sorry to put you on the spot as soon as you walk in through the door. <laughs> It was just that perfect timing. Um, yes, thank you very much, and thank you uh, before uh, Mayor Messina to our Wurundjeri um, Corporation representative, Emma Mildenhall, who's unfortunately had to leave. Um, she had a, an appointment uh, with the state government, um, so we certainly couldn't keep her waiting from that. Um, just, uh, I'd like to also pay my respects um, and add my respects to Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Um, and, those of, uh, and those who are watching us through the live stream and acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people um, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I would just uh, like to do a little bit of housekeeping. It's one of the, the main duties of an MC. Uh, so the bathrooms are just around behind me to the side uh, near where the dinosaur is. Don't be afraid of the dinosaur. Um, Catering, we have uh, a small amount of morning tea catering available um, to, towards the back of the room uh, and you're welcome to stay uh, at the conclusion of the formal part of the event uh, to mix and mingle and introduce yourselves and talk to each other. I know it's a novel concept, talking to each other in person uh, and um, partake of the catering. Um, so please, you're all welcome to do that. Just a word of apology before we move on. Uh, we have... Um, uh, through our acknowledgements and our welcome to country, we have certainly um, uh, acknowledged Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And unfortunately, we were going to have a representative here today uh, from Dadi Manwaro, um, which is a local Aboriginal organisation um, growing from strength to strength, uh, who have a youth division. Uh, and we did invite uh, Ricky Bamblett um, from Dadi uh, to come and speak uh, and talk about the experiences in particular of Aboriginal young people. Ricky, unfortunately, has been struck with COVID, as so many of us have been, including my colleague Megan, and can't be with us here today. Um, so I would like to apologise because we will be missing that, uh, that unique uh, reflection, um, but um, we'll try to, uh, to organise another uh, avenue where we can um, give, get that perspective. Um, so who do we have here in the room? Uh, well, we've got a cross-section of uh, service providers, representatives of organisations like Jobs Victoria. Uh, we've got people from the regional jobs coordinator programs. Uh, we fit both into the inner Melbourne region and the northeast region, and we have representatives from both those regions here with us today. Uh, we've got local learning uh, and training providers. Um, we've got our jobs advocates with us here today. We've got our partners from Brotherhood of St Lawrence joining us. Uh, and we've also got counsellors and employers in the room. Um, so there's a real mixture of people here uh, who can all add value to the conversation, I'm sure. 
Um, so why are we here? Uh, principally, we're here to hear the perspective of young people themselves, and I'll be introducing them very shortly, uh, who will be giving their experiences of how they navigate through the, um, through the employment minefield in some respects. Um, but how we'll hear about how they get jobs, um, how they keep them or not in some cases, uh, and how um, the whole, um, the whole uh, situation works out for them. We'll also hear from the employer perspective, and we have two employers joining us today who employ principally um, and predominantly young people about the perspective uh, from their side, the benefits of employing young people, and of course the challenges that come with that. Uh, but mostly we're also um, using this opportunity to gather people around uh, and, I guess, work towards a solution um, to the problems that are still bedeviling us as a result of COVID and, and before, uh, one of which is the unique conundrum that we have, that even though we still have relatively high numbers of people who are unemployed, there is also increasing numbers of unfilled vacancies uh, from a whole range of different sectors, and we've got employers with us here today um, who are in that situation, can't find people. Um, what's happening with that disconnect? Hopefully we get to talk about that at some point in time. But the plan is to try and get Darabin working together again. And hot off the press, um, uh, I, I had some information sent through to me yesterday uh, that as far as youth unemployment is concerned in the city of Darabin, uh, it is tracking down um, it's, uh, it, it's trending downwards, um, but it's still at higher than pre-COVID levels. Um, so there's still quite a bit of work to do. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you um, Cleantha Delana from Darabin Youth Services, who will in turn be introducing our panel of young speakers and we'll be hearing from their perspective. So if you could welcome to the microphone, Cleantha, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Phil. Um, before I give a brief introduction about myself, I just wanted to do a quick acknowledgement of country as well. So I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land and recognise their continuing connection to the land, waters and culture. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past, present and emerging of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present here today. Um, so just a brief introduction about myself. Um, my name is Cleantha. Um, I started here at Darabin Youth Services on student placement last year, um, completing a certificate four and diploma um, in youth work. And then um, fortunately enough, I was offered a permanent role, so I'm here full time. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, the first speaker I would like to introduce from our panel today um, is Carmen. Um, Carmen is 17 years old and is currently completing year 12, so um, I'll now ask her to come up um, and share a bit more about her experience. Um, good morning everyone. As you heard, my name is Carmen. I'm completing year 12. Um, back in 2020, when I was 15, I worked at Coles on the checkout. Um, Sorry. Uh, I did that for about a year and resigned in early 2021 due to wanting to focus more on my studies um, as I had some issues trying to balance a job and high school. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, as stated, I no longer work as focusing on Year 12, but will occasionally help out a band at their gigs. Um, I think that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing um, your story. Our next speaker is Deng. Deng is 25 and currently works for a recruitment agency. Um, he is also here to share his journey with employment. Hello guys, so yeah, my name is Deng, and um, I was originally born in Sudan, but as you can tell from my accent, I've been here quite a while. So um, from Sudan, I migrated to Egypt, and I eventually came here in 2003 for a better life. Um, so my journey is different to a lot of people. So um, I didn't get a job until I was 20 years old, 
But um, through my high school years, I did apply to numerous places. So from, um, from retail jobs like Kmart, Big W, or even, um, sorry, even um, fast food restaurants like KFC and um, Hungry Jack's. But um, my application either never got looked at or it got rejected. And um, I felt like it was because of my name. So um, because of that, I stopped applying for jobs for years and I uh, focus mainly on my obsession at the time and that was basketball. So um, I went to America for uh, a year or so and coming back from America, I came to Australia and started my job application again, but for the sole purpose of going back and uh, funding, I guess, getting money to fund my college. Um, but coming back to Australia, I found that it was hard to, uh, I guess, gain employment or even get the opportunity to uh, um, interview. Um, so yeah, uh, for a couple of months, I had to rely on Centrelink to financially support me. And I went through the Job Active um, program where I felt, and probably a lot of teens feel, it's quite useless. So I didn't secure a job or interview at all. But um, I eventually came across labor hire. So um, labor hire, what they do is, um, so it's a recruitment agency as well. So what they solely focus on is um, um, warehousing. So doing things as, such as pick packing, um, container unloading, and uh, working on the production line. So um, the company that I came across is Staff Australia. So they do have your best interests, which I felt like. And you're almost guaranteed to have uh, interview. Um, so yeah, uh, I really recommend uh, going through uh, recruitment agencies, especially coming straight out of high school if you don't know what you're doing, because it's a, it's a good way, I guess, to have money on the side. But for me, it was more than money because it kept me out the streets, because um, there's an issue going on, especially with my culture. Um, they they're pretty much just doing dumb things, creating troubles, and yeah, so having a job for me, uh, I guess, kept me out of um, doing dumb things, getting into trouble, and at the same time, helped me financially support my family, because my mom wasn't working at the time, and yeah, that's my story right now. So I am a recruitment consultant, so now I help people get a job, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Ding. Our next speaker is Ferris. Uh, Ferris is 20 years old and um, recently worked with Toll Logistics. So take it away, Ferris. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is, um, sorry, one second. My name is Ferris, I'm 20 years old. Um, I've studied um, in East Preston Islamic College, not too far from here. Um, the hub has helped me with a lot of things, such as fixing up my resume, cover letters, just a lot of things to experience and stuff. Also, they got me my first job at Coles at the age of 17. And um, as I was turning 18, they um, started giving me shifts and uh, like really helped me out with shifts and with money and stuff. And also, not long ago, I got fired from my, last, my recent job at Toll. I was doing warehousing. I got fired for... Um, so there's something called standby, standby shifts, which aren't confirmed shifts. They usually call you in and then tell you you have a shift tomorrow, but it's not confirmed. So I got fired for not attending my standby shifts, which was pretty, yeah, pretty dumb, not my fault. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it about me. A bit too shy to talk. <laughs> that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing, Ferris. Our last speaker for today is Naomi. Naomi is 19 years old and currently works in the hospitality and retail sector alongside studying. So let's hear Naomi's story. Thanks, Cleantha. Hello, everyone. I am a young carer and have been from the age of seven years old. I care for my siblings who are on the autism spectrum, as well as other family members with various health issues. I myself also have health issues, including being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease during the pandemic, which in itself was hard enough. 
I'm studying a certificate for in companion animal services, having class twice a week. Studying alone takes up a lot of my schedule as I have to travel three hours a day as well as seven hours of classes and not to mention the homework. These have all factored in to create challenges for myself in the workplace, but I haven't let it discourage me and have used them to better myself in the workforce as these include certain days which I'm unavailable as well as the unpredictability and short notice in treatments and hospital admissions, which can be undesirable for many employers. I currently have two jobs in retail and hospitality However, I have not worked them since January due to a decline in my health. I've been go I will be going back to work in the next few weeks, which is exciting, but also nerve wracking. A really big part of my job hunting experience was the Northland Jobs Fair back in 2019. It was really helpful for me to go through the interview process multiple times in the same night. This event led me to three job offers, which I accepted to, one in retail and one in hospitality. These two jobs really helped me develop and build my customer service skills, especially with the diversity and volume of customers around Northland and it being the Christmas period. I still use these skills in my daily life, including in the workplace. And as I continue to go through life, I look forward to seeing how the workforce evolves, especially around the young challenges for people um, and young people, which they face with employment, and currently hope that they have a better and stronger future ahead of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. How great is it to hear such different perspectives from everyone? Um, so now we'll be asking the panel some key questions that we believe will highlight important, important areas of discussion. So, Naomi, this one's for you. Young people often feel afraid to talk about management, about issues that they may be having, for example, requesting more shifts, requesting leave, their rights at work, discussing illness. Why don't they want to talk to management? What would better equip young people to understand their rights? So I myself have had issues speaking to my managers. I found this is because each manager is so different and oftentimes very busy. At one job, I had a manager who was very caring and understanding, whilst at another, I had a manager who was quite intimidating. I've seen how different the responses can be, and it can be quite overwhelming having the uncertainty as well as their sense of authority, and some managers do unfortunately use these against staff. However, staff need to understand their rights as it's easy to be burnt out and have issues such as workplace bullying occurring without even knowing and not knowing how to stand up for their rights and this is never acceptable in the workplace. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, Carmen, this one's for you. There are some industries that appear to have a lot of vacancies at the moment, cafes for example. Why aren't young people flocking to these places? Um, I'd say there's two main issues or reasons why young people aren't flocking to these job opportunities. The first one being how they apply for most of their jobs. Most people I know now apply through jobs online and these businesses like cafes don't usually have an online job portal unlike the bigger companies like Coles or McDonald's. Um, the other main reason would be Way with this. Uh, it seems much more specialised a job. You'd have to have, for example, in a cafe, probably some barista training, maybe how to organise some of the food. Uh, and unlike, again, those big corporations that have the same menu, usually all over the country, or the same type of system, it can just be a lot of training that might not be seen as useful in the future. Yeah. Good answer. Thank you. Um, Dane, this one is for you. What was your main challenge in finding work? What finally got you over the line? Um, so my biggest challenge when I was applying for jobs was that my CV necessarily didn't get looked at, as I mentioned before. And um, so 
it's either I get no response or it got rejected. Uh, I believe it's because I have such a unique name and that has always been a struggle for me. So um, for me, I always believed that I was capable of um, doing the job more than the people that I guess got picked over me. And um, when I was given the opportunity, I did display that. I strongly believe that there are plenty of people out there that are 10 times stronger and more capable, capable of doing a job, but they fall into massive hurdles such as someone not being able to pronounce their name or for myself, I guess, stereotypes that I have to overcome. So um, being coloured and having such a unique name, there, there's so much barriers that I had to break in a way. So um, it's gotten to the point where my family has named, like I guess my youngest siblings, a more Western name. So they don't have the disadvantage that I or they went through. So my youngest siblings are named John and I have, uh, John and um, Abraham, and I have nephews and nieces that I name Isaiah, Noah, and Grace. So they, they're going away from more uh, as the traditional or cultural names. And so I do in a way don't like that because we're, I guess, in a way, shedding or going away from our culture. But um, what I found is that employers would rather employ someone that has an easier name to pronounce. And uh, my question is, why does it matter where that person comes from or how their name sounds? Um, what got me over the edge, as I mentioned before, is uh, was going, uh, going through recruiters. I feel like they, because you, you are guaranteed to have an interview, so they they actually get to see what your personality is like, and you get to display what you can't convey in a in a I guess in a job application, which is your drive, your passion, and body language. And being a recruiter myself, I I've seen a lot of um, I guess resumes that are in the the best in the world, but when it comes to interviews, they sometimes buckle and they don't get the job. So, um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, um, yeah, recruiters are really good. Um, so for me, what I want known today is I want employers to give uh, people a chance and you don't know what type of asset that a person will bring to the business and they might actually change your culture for a positive. So yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Nice, thank you. Varys, lucky last, this one's for you. So there is so much discussion in youth employment about how to get a job. You've had a quite few jobs yourself. So what I would like to know is, what would have helped you keep the jobs you had? Particularly, what could the managers have done better for you? I'd say if managers became more close with the employees, spoke to them more and became like more friendly and um, I'd say, like, build, like, a friendship, build, like, a connection to something. Um, obviously, the employee has to play a role, too, by being consistent and being dedica dedicated to the job. Um, being on time and everything, not, yeah, not, not like how I was late. Um, yeah, that's about it, I reckon. Thank you everyone for answering those questions with great perspective and detail. Um, I would now like to hand it over to the audience. So, um, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask any of the panelists? Feel free to raise your hand. No one? Yes, up the back. So just for the guys on live stream, the question was, um, what do you guys think um, employers don't understand about young people? Um, any of you guys want to answer? Um, I'll answer it firstly. I think employers don't understand that young people also have a life to live while they might not be managing a household or buying cars, things like that. They still have things like school. They might have health issues. They still always have something going on in the background. Um, and it could be that it's their first job, so they might get walked over a little bit as well. 
Um, so just understanding that work-life balance is really important, especially at that young age, to want them to continue to work. Nice. Thanks, Naomi. Did you have something to add as well, Carmen? Uh, my answer was mostly the same, but one other thing that I think most employers don't realise is that uh, they treat young people like they're adults when they're not necessarily. We don't have the same experience or knowledge in general, so. Nice. Does anyone else have a question? Yes. So for the guys, again, on live stream that are um, tuning in, the question was um, the gap between hospitality and retail, um, what could be done, like say like a short course, could a short course be um, implemented to help with employment? Was yes. that sum it up? Yeah. Um, does anyone want to answer that? I have an answer for that one again. <laughs> um, so for my experience being in hospitality as well as retail, being trained in a big corporate on the job is very difficult, um, especially working in a shopping centre. There is a lot of customers. Um, so having training outside of work, I think, would be beneficial. Not necessarily a course. It would be the same training that you would do whilst in the store or wherever it is that you work. But just having that off-site or in different hours um, would be a lot better and less stressful. Um, getting to learn on the job when it's um, there's so much going on and it's a high stress environment is really difficult especially when it is your first time working um, so yeah I think it would be beneficial to help get over that line nice does anyone else want to answer that it's not exactly an answer but more of an example of what a short course might be like um, because at my school we have something called the Learner Profile, which we will, over the year, um, do many different courses to try and get uh, more training and skills to apply for jobs. Uh, I believe today, actually, they're starting to run a barista course. So if that could happen more often, that's probably a good idea to have it in schools. Yeah, definitely. What was your... <laughs> um, my next question is about, um, obviously, you've identified a racism based on names that have been identified in CVs. Just for the, again, for the guys online, the question was, um, how, how can we de-identify resumes and cover letters um, for those who come from ethnic backgrounds? Um, just so that, uh, just in general, yeah, sorry. Just, yeah. yeah, just so that racism isn't in play at all. Um, yeah, and that question was for Ding. For, I guess, in, in, in recruiting, I guess, compared to uh, traditional employment, I feel like they don't discriminate, uh, especially towards um, names and all that. They just basically go off your experience and all that, and then they have a separate interview before actually um, you have an, another additional uh, interview with the, with the company. So there's not necessarily, um, I guess, prejudgment there. Your, your given the opportunity to, uh, um, I guess, I don't know how to word it, but you're given the opportunity to actually display that you can do the job. So um, what I necessarily liked in the past was giving your resume to the actual company itself. So they firsthand see, see your personality and see how you are compared to going online. So I feel like there's a massive difference there than what's it called, how it was today. So you would say like it's um, it would be better to go back to old school ways old school. by handing in resumes yeah. Yeah. Um, than being online. Yeah. Hundred percent, yeah. Definitely. Cool. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes.
So for the guys online, um, Kelly from Price has um, asked a question. So her question was, um, how, d how does Price um, communicate to young people about short co courses available? Um, what's the best way of communication of um, letting you guys know that there are these courses out there? Um, personally, I think social media is a big one, um, just because it's inevitable, especially with the pandemic, everything was online. Um, that's where a lot of people find out this information, as well as it gives you the opportunity to see who's engaging with that information and where it's actually reaching, um, which I think is also important to know. Um, I, I'd say contacting places where people study could be a um, good chance, like if there's a school newsletter, letting people know in that is a good way of getting it out to students. And also uh, advertising it in places like The Hub. Like, there's a job board over there that quite a few people will come in and have a look at. So that could be a good place to let people know. Thank you. Um, yes? For the guys online again, um, the Munro had asked a question saying, "What platform, like what social media platform, um, would you like to see these things appear on?" In my opinion, I would say Instagram and TikTok. I feel like um, most people in our age, I guess, spectrum, that's the two platforms that we use the most. I think, unfortunately, there is a lot of stigma around social media, and different apps have different stereotypes, but. Being your own account, I think you have that sort of um, flexibility in what you post and what it is about and who can engage with your content. Um, so putting it on the two biggest apps seems like the best idea. But also people do engage in Facebook or even if my grandma saw something on Facebook that she thought would be interesting for me, <laughs> she, 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 she would pass that on. Um, so just posting it wherever, even whether it be YouTube, someone will come across that as it is social media. Um, I'd just say not Spotify. No one likes Spotify ads. <laughs> You're just going to annoy them. <laughs> not to take a shot at everyone who has Facebook, that they're grammars. <laughs> um, yes, you got a question? Nice. So uh, the question was from Fran from Headspace. Um, the question was, uh, what sort of development that you had? What sort of development did you get um, throughout high school or outside of high school? Um, career development. My apologies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what was your last question? Yeah. So um, have you had an employer um, be fully invested um, in your development before? So I kind of prepared an answer to this question earlier um, when it comes to schools and career development and pathways. I found mainstream high school, um, as well as TAFE, only really touched on employment in things like trades and university, um, not so much going into the workforce or even things like TAFE. Um, I think that it's important to touch on these topics through school um, but make them more inclusive um, because a lot of people don't end up following on from high school going back to school and university um, so these programs were only really helpful if that was the pathway you wanted to do um, so yeah I think it's important to make it more inclusive does anyone have an experience that they want to share where an employer's been invested in them um, that second part I very like resonate with so the current company that I'm in so I've only been in the role since November but um, they are really invested in my development not just in work but in personal life as well and with that because they take pride in that I feel like I'm more happy to go into work and if other employers will like that I feel like you would necessarily get a higher retention rate for kids coming into uh, to work because they feel like you, they actually care about their employees. And yeah, it's just a fun experience going into work every day because they actually care about you. And um, yeah, it's the finan the financial, it's a financial gain, but at the same time, I'm growing as a person. So 
it's really good when they care about you. So. Nice. Uh, yes, question up the back. So the question was, um, who do you turn to when you hit these barriers? And what was the last one? Uh, what, what would help you and what would help you? Yep. Yeah. Ferris? <laughs> Don't do that to me, please. <laughs> Oh, was that Naomi? I was just saying, um, when Paris had his issues with work, he turned to the hub, which I think is a great place to start. Yeah, definitely. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> um, last question up the back. So the question asked was, um, what other topics um, can be covered when it comes to employment other than um, cover letters, resumes, um, and interviews? Um, I'd say having a small course on like uh, customer service because it's talking to like seven different people in a short span of time, and you need to know how to talk to them because. It's not like you're talking with your friends. You have to be professional about it. So you would say like a, like a customer service speaking session and how to deal with difficult customers and um, what happens if you're stuck in a predicament that you're not sure of. So like, like role playing. Yeah. yeah. Just cool. to add to that, I was going to say mentoring as well. So having someone there for you before you get the job, during the job, and if you have a decide to leave the job, um, I think it's important just so you can understand your rights as well and have someone to turn to if you do find yourself in a struggle in the workplace. Um, yeah. Yes. Amazing. Thank you for that. Alrighty. I think I will close up the questions. No, there's one more. Oh, there's one more? I missed one? Yes. Sorry, I've missed that first bit of that. Interview techniques. Yep. So the question was, um, is interview techniques um, offered or is that encouraged to be spoken about? I feel like interview techniques is often talked about like just face to face with one person maybe giving you an example of questions but actually running formal interviews um, to practice with I don't find happens often especially group interviews I never got practice before heading into one um, so I think actually holding sessions that are formal you get dressed up for things like that is important rather than just face to face talking about the questions. The, the, um, the comment back was, would uh, a style setting of like speed dating where you can go around and have different conversation um, be beneficial? I think I'm also talking about actually, as if it's a real interview, running it, but they know that it's not. It's just to, for learning purposes. Rather, than, um, but actually having activities and questions that would be so. I, I suppose you can do it in a speed dating style, but just whatever is going to fit the criteria best, whatever they need for that one, for example. Yeah. Can I? Uh, that question kind of gave me a thought as well. Can you guys just raise your hand if you've had, if you've been sat down before to run through an interview? Um, like a run through or a group style interview before? Have you ever had anyone give you advice about how to do a group interview or just a one on one interview? Yep. Okay. Alrighty. Um, I think that's it for questions. I'm going to pass it back to Phil now. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Cleantha, for that amazing job of facilitating that panel. Um, I think you'll agree um, 
that uh, that uh, presentation was um, was a real eye opener um, for a lot of people here, um, and it was a, a great interaction um, from the audience back, obviously honing in on the things that are priority for people here. Um, I, I, I thank Joe. Uh, I've known Joe for quite some time. Um, Joe runs a business called Car Joe Furniture. Um, and uh, has um, been in business for a very long time and has consistently um, uh, employed and offered opportunities to young people um, through apprenticeships um, as well as through direct employment. Um, so I thank Joe for his continuing passion in that area and, and supporting the young people of the North. Um, I, and I acknowledge it hasn't always been easy. Uh, at times it's been very difficult, obviously, um, finding people for the opportunities that are there, uh, but it's employers like Joe, and we also have other employers in the room. I've just noticed Gary from Sunny Electronics coming to the room, um, who's uh, an employer uh, in the Northcote area, um, and uh, they're, they're a growing business, and at the moment uh, recruiting and having difficulty um, finding people for those opportunities. So it was really interesting to hear about those social media platforms. Uh, that was something that kind of resonated with me because uh, we tend to advertise most of our stuff on Facebook. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I hardly ever look at those other platforms myself. I looked at Instagram maybe once or twice and it just looks like a whole bunch of pictures to me. I don't even know how you use that to advertise, but uh, hopefully a, a young person can actually show me at some stage how you do that. Uh, before we go on, just a quick acknowledgement. Um, we, we've heard uh, from uh, Councillor Lena Messina, our Mayor, before. just want to acknowledge that we have two other councillors who have joined us. Uh, three other councillors. Um, Councillor Susan Rennie is with us today, Councillor Trent McCarthy and Councillor Julie Williams. And I really thank you for giving up your time and coming along um, to join us here this morning. All right, so moving right along. We're moving now into hearing from two employers um, who do do a lot of work uh, in employing young people. Uh, employing groups of young people um, and we want to get their perspective and uh, offer the opportunity to have a bit of a, a Q&A um, perhaps from the young people asking these guys questions. So if we can start off with um, Janetta Hopkins who is the Retail tra Traineeship Manager for McDonald's um, for the Northern Region. Janetta, if you would like to grab a microphone, yeah. Munro will help um, organise the sizing of it. And Catherine as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, excuse the nerves. It's been about two years since I've had to do anything like this. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, as you said, my role is a retail traineeship manager um, for McDonald's. Um, myself, I started working there when I was 15. Um, so, I've been there for 29 years. Um, so don't do the maths. Um, <laughs> the role that I'm in now, I've been in currently for about 10 years um, full time. So my owner owns 10 stores across um, Victoria, five in the northern, five in the eastern suburbs. Um, and I have started off in a role in, in a hiring training people role um, when I was probably about 19. I started doing that. Um, and now I teach Certificate 3 in retail to our employ employers. So um, taking these 15, 16, 17 year olds that are in their first job um, and have very little experience and putting them through a Certificate 3 program um, to gain them experience in all different aspects. Um, McDonald's also, like most industries, um, is really, really been hit with COVID with staff issues. Um, so obviously during COVID, we were unable to hire. <laughs> We couldn't hire people, we couldn't run interviews, we had to do interviews on Zoom, which doesn't really give you the ability to connect with the people, so we didn't do a lot of it. Um, prior to that, we were doing group, we changed to group interviews, um, so rather than sit down with a 15, 16 year old face to face, where they're absolutely scared, and um, what's going on, we moved to group interviews, which basically involved sitting around a table playing Jenga, and we just let them play games <laughs> for about 20 minutes. Um, just to see how they interacted with each other, how they spoke to each other, who was the leader, who, um, who sat there quietly, who brought other people out, who, who you know, was a team person, who encouraged everyone else, um, and then sat with them for five minutes after that to have a quick chat. But um, we definitely moved to that sort of um, wanting to see the actual person rather than just the information on the piece of paper. Um, we do do our hiring via um, online, as most places do, because that's where most teenagers spend their time. 
Um, McDonald's is very big on every social media platform. They advertise on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Catherine here, who does a lot of our training, she makes TikTok videos and sends them out to the staff. Um, so we engage them on every single platform that we can possibly think of. Um, McDonald's at the moment is currently, I know with our business, um, Catherine has rejigged our training system to get people trained um, quicker and better so we can actually hire more people, uh, so we can get more people. So I think some of it, we're pretty much looking with some of our stores to nearly double their numbers. Yeah. So I know if using Thomas Town as an example, that store is about 80 staff minimum short of where it needs to be to run the store happily. Um, eight zero. So that's one of our stores. So we're probably looking at hiring nearly a thousand people across our ten stores. Um, we're not. Well, we do predominantly hire young people. So obviously our focus is very much between that um, fifteen to twenty-five years age bracket. Um, at the moment, McDonald's is hiring every single age bracket you can possibly think of. Um, we have a lovely lady that works at our Lower Temple Stowe store that's in her fifties, and she loves it. Um, and that's one of the benefits I think. I found working at McDonald's, because obviously I'm in my 40s, um, sometimes I don't feel like I'm 40, because I'm surrounded by 15 and 16 year olds. Um, and one of the bonuses of being a manager with all these um, young people that I feel that I can relate to them is I actually have a child myself who's in their age bracket. So whenever I'm talking to them, interviewing, I think of it if it was my child. So my son's 21, he works for us as well. So I get to hear from the staff perspective what they don't like and what they like as well. Um, Catherine herself is pretty much nearly in that bracket <laughs> herself. Um, so, and she's advancing in her career at McDonald's. So, um, obviously, we want to get as many staff in as we can. Um, we're hiring like up to 10 people a week in some of the stores, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> trying to get them on board. And I think at the moment your aim is at two weeks, one yeah. week, within Just one less, to two weeks yeah. onboarding, um, hiring every age bracket, every demographic, every availability. Um, school kids, kids that aren't at school, pe um, people that, you know, school, we, we know school's not for everyone. Uh, I have a lot of people doing my Cert 3 program that they have no intention of going to university. Um, so you, they're using McDonald's and the Cert 3 program to get experience. And we know that when they finish, they'll, they'll, they'll leave and go somewhere else. And we know that's the nature of our business. So we're happy to develop them so that they can move on, take our skills and go somewhere else. Uh, the benefit to us is we get all these crew that work different hours, um, all different types of people, a lot of different characters. Um, people get to make new friends, socialise with people they might not have socialised with in their school um, capacity. Um, so, yeah, it's, that's what we're at. Yes? Yeah, we get a lot. We get a lot that we they, and then we say to them, "You weren't successful this time." It doesn't mean you weren't good for the job. It just means you weren't at those stages. We were going through stages where we could only hire this many people at a time because that's all we could onboard. But now with Catherine, re yeah. But now with Catherine rejigging everything, we can actually now no no longer put limits on ourselves and say this month we can only hire 20 people. Now it's like we're going to interview 10, and if all 10 are good, we're just going to hire all 10. <laughs> we're going to make it work. Their, tr their training is if a customer gets like that, it's actually not their responsibility to do it. They're told from day one that they're to just remove themselves, just walk away, and the manager the managers to deal with that situation. We, we're very very clear from day one that they're not to put themselves in that situation. If they see, no, no, as in like as in if they see it happening, just yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. the, ma the manager should be there. The manager should take control of that. Yes. 
So that's more of an issue of if, if she's resigned because of that, hopefully she's actually mentioned that because unless the, some, the senior managers know that's the situation, they can't do anything about it. So in most situations, I say that to most of my staff, if there's an issue, you need to speak up because if we don't know about it, we can't fix a problem. Um, it's the same with customer complaints. If a customer doesn't tell us there's a problem, we can't fix it. It's the same in-house as well. If a crew person doesn't tell us that there's an issue, um, as soon as there's an issue, we can fix it or we can put something in place. Um, in their onboarding process, when they do their online orientation, one of the um, modules that McDonald's has recently added was the workplace violence um, prevention module. So they noticed there was a bit of an issue and they're trying to provide the staff with day one, like before they even get on the floor, that those steps of like how to stand side on, so not to aggravate anyone, the managers that you can talk to, but also different like techniques to if someone is, you know, being quite aggressive at you, like what also what aggression looks like and how you can go about dealing with that. So from day one, all the trainees in their first orientation, their first shift, they're doing that module. So they're kind of prepared when they get on the floor with how to approach that situation, but always yeah, being comfortable to speak to a manager if the situation escalates. I keep having trouble with my microphone cord, sorry about that. <laughs> Obviously not very skilled with using a microphone. Um, just uh, with, with the questions, thank you for, for the question, Councillor Williams. Um, I'm just going to reinterpret the question, or not reinterpret, yep. but repeat the question, just for the benefit of um, the live stream audience who can't hear the question. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if we get a question, I'll just um, repeat that question well, before it gets answered. Yep. Yep. I think Councillor Rennie. <laughs> uh, yep. Councillor Rennie? So the question from Councillor Rennie, um, uh, thanking McDonald's for the, uh, the great work you're doing in preparing young people. But the question was about um, the age uh, at which uh, young people can uh, be employed, uh, and specifically, can 14-year-olds uh, be employed um, at McDonald's? No, back when I started, we could, because I started at 14 and nine months. Um, but now the re legal requirement is 15. Um, we can pretty, we could interview someone prior to today. My advice to people is if you want to start working at 15, start applying before, like one to two months before you turn 15. Um, my son started the day he literally start, had his interview the day on his 15th birthday. Um, and we can interview them prior to their birthday. We just can't actually put them as hired until the day they actually turn 15. Um, and there's so many under 15 that are so eager and we get kids come in all the time with resumes and asking questions and stuff like that. And unfortunately, um, we're not allowed to. I think Western Australia, they're allowed to work at 14, but every single person working with that person has to have a working with children's. And they're not allowed to work more than two hour shifts. So there's a lot of restrictions. That's right. Um, Nicole, I believe you had a question. Uh, sorry. Oh, Janine, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yes, the mask. <laughs> Janine, go for it. Thanks, Janine. Um, and uh, uh, Janine was, is from Brotherhood of St. Lawrence and was speaking about some of the preparatory work that they do uh, for people entering the workplace. And the question to McDonald's is what preparation, what preparatory work do you do when you're onboarding uh, people into McDonald's? Yeah, so from that um, first, they get the interview, they'll get an email saying they're hired, um, they'll be contacted about their first shift. Um, with most of the stores at the moment, we're finding it easier just to do um, 
like an orientation where they're completely off floor, just filling in a bit of paperwork, um, completing some, um, there's about a 45 minute module going through the history of McDonald's, all that stuff. And then as I mentioned before, the workplace violence. And then they go through the restaurant basics, induction, so going through safety, security, cleanliness, um, the Macca's experience, so um, customer service. And then that's pretty much their first shift. So they're just sitting with, um, usually it'll be with the um, hiring and training manager, so someone they interacted with in the interview, and then also maybe a few crew coaches. And then so they get to meet, they get a bit of a um, restaurant tour as well, so get shown like where um, their change rooms are, um, where the manager's office is, um, all that stuff. And then um, when they come in for their first shift, um, through all their training shifts, they're partnered with a crew coach. So someone that's been in the, um, in the business for a little bit of time, they're really not knowledgeable, um, friendly, uh, welcoming, and they stick by that person for all their training shifts. So um, the kind of schedule we've got at the moment is they'll do like a four hour training shift with the crew coach, being there for support, showing them how to do things exactly by their side, and then also getting that chance to practice by themselves before when they might have a shift where they don't have the crew coach by their side, but they still have supportive crew coaches around them and the managers. So like they're not like left in the dark. They've got that support of this is the, pro this is the process. Let me show you. So it's like an I do, we do, you do. The crew coach will show them. They'll work together and then the crew coach will observe while the trainee does it. So it's really supported. So when they get to those shifts where they're not, they don't have a crew coach by their side, they should feel a bit confident or if they're unsure to speak to a manager. Okay, thank you. Just one more question and we'll take this question from the mayor, Lena Messina. Thank you, uh, Mayor Messina. Um, so if, if I um, get the question uh, correctly, uh, you preface it by talking about the diversity um, that we have in, in Melbourne um, and spoke about uh, in particular international students and the increasing numbers of international students who are now coming back into Melbourne, into my universities. Um, and the question was about how can we make the hospitality industry sexy um, to, uh, to make it more attractive um, for young people in particular, but, but for others as well. Um, to come into, not just to see it as a stopgap, not just to see it as a very short-term arrangement, just in between school and uni, uh, but it can actually make a career out of it. Um, we don't really have an issue attracting um, a lot of international students because our stores are 24 hours and we work a lot around the university structures. Um, we actually get an influx of applicants for us. Um, a lot of the other hospitality, maybe because they don't have the same opening hours as us, could be the issue. I know a lot of um, the international students that work for us work a lot of late night, overnights, very early mornings, because um, it fits in with their university structures. They sometimes have multiple jobs. We're very flexible to work around that sort of things. Um, I think it's the flexibility side of it, really, for the international students, because a lot of them do have um, very big university courses um, requirements and with their structure of hours as well. So, yeah, the limited hours does, does struck, struggle with them as well. And I think as well in that interview process showing um, these applicants the different pathways there are in McDonald's. So going through and um, getting a certificate three in retail, we do have, McDonald's has um, in Collingwood, uh, like a head office where they do um, barista courses, which was really cool and showing like an applicant um, when they come in, like, hey, you could, um, learn to become a barista, go to, go to these courses. Um, there's all these other courses like um, becoming a manager and there's all these different streams. So it doesn't just need to be like a job before you 
um, go to actually what you want to do. There's like, I'm taking my time to do my course because I'm really enjoying what I'm doing at the moment in McDonald's. So there's lots of different like st streams within McDonald's that it's not just that one stop before you move on. That's great. Um, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what can we do to make hospitality more inviting, generally? <laughs> Anybody else want to take a crack at that one? Um, Joe Conti from AGA. a lot of that was lost the last couple of years because I know mm -hmm. McDonald's has like we, we we had an event last night yes like we literally had an event last night where they McDonald's got all the department managers from the whole of Victoria together in the mm. city mm. Um, and we went to that um, we haven't had any of that for two years yeah, yeah so it's been um, really hard to keep those crew like and build those friendships so like t about two years ago we used to do like um, as all the stores yes. would go temp in bowling and um, action sports and I play soccer and all that stuff and I know there's a few um, currently just um, at some of the stores even some of the stores have like a soccer team and they play they're called like the McDonald's like something soccer related but they have that friendship outside of work which then like makes them enjoy it. like come to work and see those soccer mates which we haven't been out had the last couple of yeah. years so hopefully, hopefully we bring all that back again yeah well, I can see so many hands shooting up, wanting to, to get involved in this conversation. Um, we do need to move on shortly, but uh, we probably maybe two more questions, two more questions and, and we'll move on. Um, Tom Burgess from the Local Learning and Employment Network. Yeah. And I'm very, I'm very heavily involved in the LEN uh, yeah. pre-COVID. I used yeah. to go to the LEN meetings every couple of months yeah. um, with RTO. I go to the Ridges. I volunteer my time to go to Ridges, which is real job industry interviews, which is basically real industry job interviews. Yeah. Yeah. The, the basically like speed dating, <laughs> um, a whole day of interviews, um, and cruise expos, which we were talking about earlier. Um, we we go to all of those um, with McDonald's to try and get the word out of what we can offer and. Mm. And answering the question before about uh, hospitality trying to attract people, there, there's a, a, a program called PART, P small a, T, H, capital T, H. It's run by the restaurant and catering industry. And what it does is that there are five week internships that uh, young people can get, participate in and be part of. And then at the end of that, the employer that they're with, if that if it all works out well, then there's, there's your journey start in career. So the hospitality, if you walk around the streets and just see that the hospitality industry are advertising, you get desperate. So Everywhere. All 
hospitality. hospitality. Every 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 cafe, every cafe you walk past, every yeah. restaurant you walk past has a sign in their window. Mm -hmm. They all need staff. Yep. Um, uh, so just uh, briefly, um, just for the benefit of the people at home, um, Tom Burgess from the Local Learning Employment Network mentioned a program called PATH, P-A-T-H, uh, which is a federal government um, program, I believe, uh, through Centrelink, uh, which assists uh, young people prepare for work um, and offers opportunities for them to get into uh, to positions. Um, one more question, just one more. Um, Carmel? That's fantastic. And uh, Carmel from the uh, Local Jobs Coordinator Program, uh, they're just mentioning that uh, we could be tapping into more of our local talent um, and uh, our top chefs and waiters and so forth and using them as inspiration to inspire people to get into the hospitality sector. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, Joe Mimo would prefer that not everyone goes into the hospitality sector. Maybe some people <laughs> could go into the furniture making sector as well. Uh, but uh, there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of jobs to go around. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask you to thank our guests from McDonald's, Geneva and Catherine. And I'd like to invite to the microphone Joe Conti um, from AGA Apprenticeships. Um, quick personal story. I, you know, I keep forgetting to do this, but uh, I forget, forgot again. Um, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, I'm Philip O'Brien, I'm from Darabin City Council, um, and I work uh, on uh, employment-based programs. Um, very proudly work with our jobs advocates and our um, local jobs programs and our uh, Brotherhood, of, Brotherhood of St. Lawrence Javes partners. Um, so, quick personal story, I used to work for the organisation that Joe now works for. Um, it was then called Apprenticeships Plus. Yes. Uh, I was a field officer, uh, and I had uh, many, mostly young people, um, who I would go and visit in the workplace. Um, and it was a, an amazing opportunity um, to get to understand uh, what makes young people tick, but also that seeing firsthand that relationship between employers and young people and how some of them dealt really, really well uh, with um, situations that arose and others not so well. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite um, Jo now to speak about what she does with AGA um, and to hear from, uh, maybe take more questions from you guys. Take it away, so Jo. incredibly, Phil, I do now what Phil did then. <laughs> I'm actually a field officer and um, I, I work for AGA, uh, which is a group training organisation. Um, I had to get my head around that too when I started working for AGA, but I'm very privileged to be um, a field officer in this space. Um, and I get to do what one of you guys was saying you probably need in uh, the workspace, um, and that's mentor and help uh, people that come in and get employed by us and um, hopefully see them through to completion. And it works really, really well when we get the right candidate for the right spot. So um, AGA is, uh, you know, as I said, a group training organisation and we work in the areas of um, carpentry apprenticeships, um, electrical apprenticeships, plumbing apprenticeships, business traineeships, education support, IT, that kind of thing. What I specialise in, or where, where I have my, my caseload basically, is in um, within schools. So any traineeship that can happen in a school. Um, so I work with many young people uh, that come and are employed by us that work in school offices, uh, in school classrooms as education support, um, and in IT, in the IT area of the schools. So I love my job. I love that I can get people that sometimes don't get a good ATAR 
um, and really want to be teachers, they come and work with me and um, they, they work as education support. They get to see behind the scenes what happens in a school and decide, yeah, I do want to be a teacher and have the opportunity to progress and do that once they finish their qualification with us. Um, and in that space, the qualifications are Cert 3 traineeship in education support. Um, I have people that start with us um, and they move into occupational therapy. Um, they move into all sorts of areas within schools. Um, I've had business trainees that start with us and now are HR managers at the schools, um, office managers at the schools. Uh, you know, there, there's just so many um, pathways in what we do um, and it's really sad that, I don't know, it's not promoted so much in schools. You know, we, we all tend to, you know, be pushed into the university space, but this is a space that can eventually lead you there if you're not, you know, you're just not that academic at the time because maybe you get stressed in, in um, exams, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, we, we provide an awesome um, pathway into that. So um, sometimes I, I get told I get a bit too excited about what I do, um, but, but I, I love the fact that I get to help young people. And to be honest, it's not only young people I deal with. I deal with mums coming back into the workforce. I deal with people, you know, changing careers. Um, but, yeah, I do love the fact that we work in this space. Um, my approach to employing young people in particular is working with schools and working in the careers area. Um, the one thing we need to, to find out is what young people are passionate about. There's no point you coming to work with me if you want to work in hospitality. Um, but if you want to work in schools and that fits you, um, I'm going to make it as exciting as I can for you. And um, I'm in, in a privileged space where um, I get to be the, the go-to between the employee and the uh, trainee. So if one of my trainees isn't up to speed, I'm you know, in the privileged position that I can go up to them and say, listen, you're not to be wearing that kind of thing um, because they're not liking it at this end. Maybe if you, you change it up with this or, you know what, you need to come to, to school a little bit earlier just to show that you're interested in your, in your placement because I'm hearing what the employer's wanting. So um, I'm in a little bit of a privileged position to um, help people in the space that, you know, um, they work, work in for us. Um, and it, it works really, really well because we, we get people through to completion, which is awesome. Um, and the employers get, you know, the schools in, in particular, in my space, um, get the opportunity to, you know, be able to input into uh, the, the people that are working for them and, and tell them what they're wanting and hopefully we can change some behaviours. Um, challenges, I'm going to tell you honestly, um, when working with the youth, um, because I do work across, you know, different age groups, but with the youth, um, we have this thing that, uh, with resilience, I have to teach some youth about resilience. You know, sometimes you don't want to go to work, but you have to get out of bed and go to work. Um, and, you know, sometimes I feel like a mum all the time, uh, but I find it works with, you know, young people. I, I like to be somebody that nurtures young people, you know, they don't necessarily know that, you know, um, they have to do certain things. But um, when you're working in schools, they're a little bit more rigid uh, than maybe a, a traditional workplace. Um, the work ethic there is a little bit different. You have to be there on time. You have to be there to the end. Don't leave a minute early. We have teachers that have been in there for a very long time and sometimes they get narky, but you've got to get some thick skin about you, you know? Um, so we, we try and teach um, the young people about resilience and the importance of it. And, you know, we try and build that in, in young people. Um, we try and teach you about the work ethic um, that is required in schools. So some schools I work with, um, they, they, we work with special development schools. There's a lot of kids with, dis well, there, there's kids with disability. So you have to be a kind of person to work in there. We can't just put anybody in there. You've got to have that heart. So when dealing with young people and work, if I see that you have that about you, you've got that passion of helping and making a difference in someone's life, I'm, I'm going to be really happy to put you in a space like that. Um, so, you know, we teach you about work ethic and what it means um, and try and line up your way of thinking with our way of thinking. And sometimes it's a bit hard, but sometimes um, we, we, we get there, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, perseverance. We find that uh, when I'm dealing with the youth, they sometimes give up prematurely. Um, and I know that that's, you know, sometimes about, you know, the way you've, you've been, you, you know, your family background and, um, you know, not everyone's raised the same, but, you know, I guess as a field officer, I've got that privilege where I can sit there and say, okay, listen, you've got to get up and keep moving. Um, if you don't do that, uh, you, there's going to be a problem. And we, we try and, just yesterday, actually, I had a young girl come in after the fourth time. She's just, there's a real issue in schools at the moment where we have a lack of staff and, you know, all the trainees are being put into positions where they're actually doing, like, education support roles um, and they should be trainees. But the fact is there's nobody uh, in the classroom, so they have, to, they have to step up. And, I mean, they've only been with us for, for three weeks, for example. Um, 
and I have young people breaking down because it's a big job. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly on the phone trying to pick people up. Um, but the fact is, if you can get through this, you're going to be able to get through anything. So, you know, um, you know, teaching people to persevere, tough, tough gig, but that's, that's what um, we, we try and do. Well, I try and do, I should say. Um, COVID, let's, let's uh, all be honest, uh, COVID has just been a big uh, disruption in, in, a lot of, in a lot of places, and in schools in particular. Um, we've had people socially um, isolated, so getting back into a school environment is tough. Even for me today, I haven't been in front of a, a crowd <laughs> for maybe over two, two and a half years. And, you know, I had my own anxieties, and I don't even suffer from anxiety. Um, so, you know, I know that... Uh, <laughs> Oh, that was scary. Anxiety, see? <laughs> um, no, but, you know, it was a big challenge for me. So I sit back and as I was driving here thinking, goodness me, this is an issue for me. And um, I'm a 47-year-old woman that's very, you know, I'm pretty self-confident and um, can talk to anybody. My, my kids tell me to shush up at Coles, you know. Don't talk to everybody, Mum. But, you know, why not? Let's make people happy. So I'm that, that kind of a person, but I'm finding it really hard to stand here and talk to you. So imagine somebody that's coming into um, a, work, a school environment that has to deal with 30 kids. These things are, are all the challenges we face. So um, believe it or not, transport for young people, gosh, it's a big one. Um, oh, we have to be really careful where we place young people. I can't put somebody that works in Werribee and have them working in, you know, uh, in the east, for example. Imagine that every day, and uh, on a trainee wage, it's just very difficult. We have some really supportive parents, but geez, how many times can you get up and go through that every day? Um, and we, we tend to, well, I tend to find there's not that many people racing to get their driver's license. Um, when I turned 18, I had that thing straight away, you know, but now it's not a priority. So it does pose a problem. Um, so uh, when young people are relying on transport and I'm working with schools that need people there on time and these transport's running late, it, it becomes a problem. So um, I guess we're in, uh, well, in my position, I'm in a lucky place where, um, you know, we, we act as a mentor and we act as the go-between um, that we can support young people in this space. But these are real challenges that we face when dealing with young people um, and, you know, trying to get them, uh, you know, through a traineeship. The benefits of working with young people and why I love what I do is, um, you know, young people are just vibrant and... Um, you know, they're so full of energy. They think differently to me. They actually challenge the way I think, and I love that. Um, you know, you, you're never too old to grow, and it's, it's, it's quite ironic that a young person teaches an older, older person, you know, life. Um, so I really loved listening to you guys. It was so, like, it's kind of entertaining for me because I sit back thinking, oh, my gosh, that's what I think you think. But then, you know, something that you said about your name it's quite funny because my dad's mum was called Giovanna and he decided to write my name, uh, J-O-H-A-N or something. And by the time I got to grade prep, my teacher changed my name because she wanted me to become Aussie or be, be known as an Aussie girl. I don't, I, you know, at the time I thought, what, what are they doing? But, you know, we just ran with it. And now I think, geez, I wish I would have kept my name. That's, in, that's my whole identity in that, you know. So we were experiencing that too. So... Just, I, I, I did want to share that with you because um, it's a thing. But you know what? I am who I am and that's, you are who you are. You, you present beautifully and it's true. We need to get this offline, you know, this online forum thing. I don't know, reduce it maybe because I love when kids come with resumes and come and see me because you get a little bit of an insight into what, you know, they're about. So I guess we have to balance that a little bit. But um, I'll keep going. Um, working with you guys, with young, with the youth, um, they're so good with technology, right? Any time I have a problem with the phone, <laughs> I get one of my trainees, guys, come and fix this, and they make me look good. So, you know, we, we, we really have that with um, the, the youth. Um, young people don't have the limits in thinking that we have. They just think different. They think outside the, the square. So um, I love that about working with the, with the youth. Um, yeah, I guess, you know... I, I look. I love working with young people, um, and sometimes I'm a bit perplexed because we really have opportunities for young people. And I guess it's just about marrying up what you guys want and finding out your passions. Um, and it, it just um, it bewilders me because we have so many spots in what we do for young people, and yet we don't have the applicants for it. It's just I think. Do you understand what we're offering, or how can we show you what we're offering and make it attractive to you guys? Because, you know, it, it really works um, when coming into traineeships. really works, especially in our space where, you know, we've got the field officers and we can get you through to the end. 
So I would, I would love to know, I guess, from you guys what it is um, like uh, that worries you guys about getting into the workforce or what would, you know, be the thing that stops you from um, applying for jobs with us? You know? Can I open it up to you? Yeah? What do you think? If you knew about us, would you, would you be a little bit more inclined to come and apply for a job with us? Mm. I've never heard of it. I know. <laughs> um, but I just think um, ad advertising is a big thing. They need to know about it first. What, how are they going to benefit them? Because a lot of times they just think, oh, I'm just going to get into a job, that's it. Um, they need to know what it's actually about. And you structure it. Like, the way you've spoken about it, amazing. Sounds great. But a lot of people won't know about that unless they hear it. Mm. So Well, one thing I'm going to do is stop advertising on Facebook. <laughs> That's the first thing I'm going back to my employer with. Um, tick, what was it? TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. All right. It's interesting, isn't it? Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, just uh, uh, once again, um, just for the benefit of uh, those people who are watching on live stream and didn't get the, the response um, from... Uh, you probably did, but I'll, I'll just... Uh, just in case, um, one suggestion um, emanating from Joe's question about what do we need to do to get more traction with young people. One suggestion was um, the advertising and the marketing, where you actually advertise and market uh, to get your message across. Um, so that young people understand what these opportunities are. And the other suggestion from Cleantha was about um, more school engagement um, and, uh, and going into schools and being more available um, in the school setting um, and the schools taking hmm. that on. Um, yep, a question uh, from Jenna. Jeanette is just making the point that um, many schools do actually do um, in-school uh, programs around um, careers, careers education, um, and uh, named a few of them, Reservoir Secondary being one, Laylaw Secondary being another. Um, but, uh, but Tom, from the Local Learning and Employment Network, your organisation works with a number of secondary schools, uh, 38 secondary schools. So it varies from school to school. 
Well, gee, Facebook's taking a battering today. Let's hope, uh, <laughs> let's hope Mark Zuckerberg's not watching. And <clears throat> a Carmel from the um, local, local, sorry, Melissa, Melissa, sorry. Um, so, sorry, just uh, yeah, to, the question to, yeah. um, from Melissa. I apologise. Um, um, excuse me. <clears throat> the question was uh, the number of uh, apprenticeships and traineeship vacancies that are out at the moment, many, many of them, around 1,000 was the, the figure uh, Melissa quoted. Why aren't young people going for apprenticeships and traineeships? Look, today has been very insightful for me, um, especially with these guys in, in telling us, uh, you know, their thoughts... But what I'm really understanding is I don't know if they know a lot about it. See, there's, there's all this stuff happening, but for some reason they don't know. So I think that's what it is with the apprenticeships and So what are you doing about it, Joe? Yeah, I know. Well, we've got a, we've got a job to do, don't we? Um, <laughs> I'm not doing a... I'm doing a TikTok tonight. <laughs> um, but, yeah... Yeah. Look, uh, give you an example. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. But I'll give you an example. Um, we have uh, carpentry as part of AGA, and we have young people that want to be carpenters. But one of the things is they, they need a driver's license. We we place them out with employers all over the place. Now, if this young man is really keen on being a carpenter but doesn't have a driver's license, he he can't do the job. So something as simple as that um, it could be a barrier. Um, you know, really, today I'm understanding that a lot of people don't... Un Look, I know when I talk about what I do, I, I do excite people because I'm excited about it, um, but I don't get to do this uh, as often maybe as I should. Um, so that's what, you know, I think it's just about getting the word out there and apprenticeships and traineeships, it's not the most well-paid area either. So um, to give you an example, I had a, a lady start with me on a traineeship, um, started in a school and... Um, Two weeks later, was offered a position uh, in education support as an education support person. Now, there, there's probably a $15 difference in between the um, wages. What are you going to do? So, you know, there, there are a few barriers. Um, anybody else? Yep. Question okay. from the floor. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, so... Um, sorry, to, to, just yes, one sorry, second. Sorry about that, Joe. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> so, sorry, your name was? Bonnie. Uh, so Bonnie was just asking about um, where there were opportunities for people from other cultural backgrounds, not necessarily school leavers, uh, to enter into apprenticeship and traineeship programs. Yeah, look, definitely. Um, in my space in particular, look, we're, we're um, building up educators to work in schools and educate young people. So it's, it's, it's a real um, fine line. So... If you're educating and teaching, uh, you know, um, numeracy and literacy, you need to be proficient in that. So when we uh, get uh, migrants approaching us in regards to that, um, you know, we're trying to lead them into um, working on their English. And once they get to a certain level, yes, we've had, I've had um, 
teachers that have come from overseas and they want to get back into schools. Um, so that they have to get, um, you know, the, the literacy and numeracy back up there again. And that is, it is a bit of a challenge because there's such great, you know, we're getting teachers that are fully qualified from overseas that, that would be an asset. Um, but the fact is, especially when you're working with kids with disability, for example, the kid needs to understand what, you know, the child, I should say, sorry, um, the child needs to understand what's being spoken to them. So they are serious barriers. But we have people push through those. They go away, do what they've got to do and come back and um, just work uh, a bit of work experience in the schools. But even, even then, realise that they need to get... Um, it, the English has to be of a certain level. But, yes, definitely, um, we have put many people through um, that, that are migrants and that have worked really hard to get... Um, into, back into schools, especially with their, their, their language, um, you know, getting their language back up to speed, and then we, we can work with that, definitely. Thanks, Joe. Do we have any other questions for Joe? Uh, one from Councillor Rennie. Uh, thank you. Can you make it easy? <laughs> oh, OK, OK. <laughs> Now, we have some... Thank, thanks oh, you. Sorry, Joe. Um, thank you. Uh, that was uh, quite a, a, a detailed question, Councillor Rennie, and I, I'll hope to do it justice. Um, but the question was framed around, um, obviously, uh, uh, environmental sustainability and how um, we're, we would not want to be encouraging everyone to go out and get a licence as soon as they can and get, in, get behind the wheel of a car um, and add more to, um, to uh, the environmental destruction of the planet um, and whether there are alternatives, alternative ways that employers could think around um, whether uh, people actually do need to be able to drive uh, to, uh, to do the jobs that they need to do mm -hmm. um, and whether there may be alternatives around uh, transport or uh, making, it, um, more, uh, making the jobs more available for young people who don't drive. Look, may maybe we need to um, uh, work on changing the mindsets of the people getting the jobs it's not really about them getting a licence, it's about them being on time to the job they're employed to do. So if you can work out a way to, you know, if mum's going to support you with this um, and going to drive you, that's one thing. If you're going to use public transport, you need to wake up early and get the bus that leaves 20 minutes earlier than the bus you're supposed to be on in case it gets delayed. It's about helping the people working in that space uh, understand and know the importance of being on time. So I don't, I don't think the issue is the driver's licence because if we have, we have so many amazing employers that uh, we uh, really, really support our young people and they get them to come to their homes if they're you know, carpenters and they drive them where they need to be, but they've got to be there on a, you know, at a certain time. They've got to get out of bed. So um, I think that's more the issue. So was that a good enough answer? Yep. Um, <laughs> Joe, you had a question? Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. Well, we're talking more about once they finish up school and, and get into an apprenticeship. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, no, no. This is the thing. This is. It's more about changing mindset. It's not really the driver's license that's the issue. It's the being on time and working out how to get to work on time. Yes. Hundred percent. Um, and sorry. Mm. 
So the, the, the point being made here um, is uh, about the difficulty of, of getting a licence and particularly the 120 hours that uh, people need to go through and whether there's any, any support for people getting driver's licence. And I think Naomi's going to take that question. Yeah. Uh, that, that's great. And just, yeah, the, uh, Naomi mentioning the L2P program, uh, which is a program run um, by many organisations here in Darabin, um, an organisation called Diverse, uh, the Volunteer Resource Agency runs the L2P program. So I just a whole fire for there for a sec, John. Um, Bridget, you had a question? Yeah, uh, Bridget, we're volunteer staff at VATC, so automotive. You do So Bridget from uh, Head Start just mentioning the, um, the organisation Keys to Drive or the program Keys to Drive is another one to help people get their driver's licence. I might just have one more question from Tom or one more point. There are many L2P programs, as, as Tom's pointing out, not just the one in Darabin. Um, so we might finish up that part of the program um, and finish up um, with the live stream. That's, that's the end of the formal part of this program. Uh, we do want to continue the conversation, so please don't all rush for the door. Um, but I want to say goodbye to our live stream audience um, who have been joining us today. So if we can all turn around to those beautiful cameras and say goodbye to our live stream audience and thanks for coming. Bye.